a professional who's been doing it over and over, it took them 18 months. So if you use a calculation of 12 months, you're literally kapoof, shooting yourself in the foot. What's up, my beautiful people? Another beautiful day as I'm headed into the office here. Now, in this episode of Jeff Koga Daily, I want to talk about a uh, Los Angeles, and this is for my people in the Los Angeles area or doing business in Los Angeles, um, and they're investors in Los Angeles. Listen up closely. Um, this is kind of my public service announcement, I guess, um, um, because I want to talk about two things as I go drive into the office. Is number one is I want to talk about is a possible uh, deal that uh, went from a two hundred thousand uh, dollar profit that I've been working on to possibly zero, and I'll also talk about uh, how I'm turning this lemon uh, into possibly a lemonade, and also I want to talk about uh, a new uh, ordinance. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, this ordinance. Now, I made a big, big uh, assumption, and it was a very, very calculated assumption I made about a uh, city ordinance, and um, it's one of those things where, hey, you know what, even, uh, I guess, uh, uh, even monkeys fall from a tree, <laughs> and I did a video about that, the concept, even monkey, how monkeys fall from a tree, and it all has to do with something called mansionization ordinance, all right? So, um, this this ordinance uh, is brought upon uh, brought upon look at that word huh um, from people in Los Angeles because uh, homeowners from Los Angeles because they're looking around in their neighborhood and what they're seeing is McMansions right these little McMansions are literally ginormous houses that are being built so typically like in a neighborhood uh, um, it, like for example it's just used like Hancock Park or something like that right um, it's a very affluent neighborhood and I've done deals in that area and even cities like Studio City I've, I've done new construction homes in that city is that people who have owned homes in that area uh, the typical footprint in that area of a home is about let's just say 2,500 square feet all right sitting on a 7,500 square feet lot or more all right now what developers have been doing to make profit in those neighborhoods, all right? And look, I, I can't, I can't act like I didn't, you know, partake on uh, on this because I've done this and um, we've made some money on this. What developers have been doing is literally building custom homes in those areas um, by using certain exemptions in the building code to build these ginormous, ginormous McMansions. All right, I'm talking about uh, houses that are almost two times bigger uh, than the, the normal footprint of the actual house. So going back to the example of 2,500 square feet, if the medium uh, footprint of the houses in that area is 2,500 square feet, to make profit, right, as a developer or a quote unquote house flipper or whatever you wanna uh, uh, you know, categorize us <laughs> uh, under, is that we would build like structures that are 4,500 square feet or near 4,500 square feet. Right, and because of that, we're able to do six-figure profits, even buying homes at near uh, fair market value. Right, and it's something that I've been preaching for years now. Where if you are in the Los Angeles area and you're in a, it's because you're in a hyper-competitive market. I would say if you're a wholesaler, then you need to go after these types of deals, um, where you can actually get them under contract. And if you get them under contract, and if you want it to wholesale, then guess what? You can wholesale to a developer or a quote-unquote flipper that's willing to do heavy construction to actually build a new construction home um, and uh, do like a 4,500 square feet uh, McMansion to uh, make profits, right? So if you do that, your wholesale fee on those can range uh, anywhere from 20, 30 grand or even more versus doing more of a cookie cutter type of deal Then when you do that, your actual assignment fee was typically under like 10 grand or whatever, right? So, so that's kind of like the background, all right? Now, now, um, since last year, there is a coalition that, that came out. This coalition basically is opposed to those new buildings, right? Meaning that they're sick and tired of seeing these McMansions being built because the, aesthetically, they're changing the, 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 the neighborhood. 
right? Meaning that these uh, homes that uh, originally have a Spanish type of feel to it, a Cape Cod or whatever, and people are building these little boxy uh, modern type of homes, right? And I did, I've done this, um, where in the neighborhood we'll build these little modern looking homes and it's so big that if you owned a home in that neighborhood, right, and uh, um, these homes are built next to you, you literally look out the window and uh, you, you might be looking at a wall. <laughs> and and because of that, these homeowners got upset about it and they created a coalition to uh, um, to uh, put a moratorium uh, against the, you know developers to actually build these McMansions, right? So this initially started with an ordinance called Measure JJJ, right? Last year, I want to say like um, um, in March, I, could, I, I believe, and then that kind of morphed into something else that the, the they finally put on the books and they went to actually vote um, this past uh, uh, March, and this was called Measure S. Right, so um, this coalition was really like going. So, so this coalition was fighting, okay, and to a point where they created a website. They even created like an Instagram account, and they were really, really like pushing people to say, "Hey, hey, you can't do this. Uh, you know, you're changing, you're changing the, the the landscape of Los Angeles City, and we need to stop these developers from from developing these McMansions." Right. So, so, so they protested, and they really pushed really hard, but. Measure S did not pass, all right? It did not pass. So in March, I did a LA housing report update about this, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. This is this is it, all right? And, and um, I literally, I think I went live, and I told everyone on here, um, and if you're listening to the podcast, you guys know that that I was talking about this, where I said, yeah, it didn't pass, so, so we're, we're good, right? Come to find out that there were quirky little other ordinances and supplemental changes to currently existing ordinance like the uh, baseline mansionization ordinance and the uh, baseline hillside ordinance. Okay, these are two other ordinances uh, that comes into play um, that was affected um, uh, affected by uh, and this this actually passed and it became in effect. I want to say March seventeenth uh, or something like that. So. So we got a call from our marketing campaign and the one that we heavily use is something called direct bypass communication. So our guy takes the call and uh, talks to the seller and the seller is uh, interested in selling. All right, and I'm excited about it, right? Because I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, looking at these numbers, anything under a million dollars, um, especially anything under nine hundred thousand dollars, I know that it can possibly turn into a deal. Now, first off, is is how do you actually know what you can build uh, build on on a lot, right? Because we're talking a lot about hey, knocking down the whole structure and uh, building these little McMansions on it, right? So the question is, how do you actually know? Well, there's different criteria, and I don't have time to explain in depth and in detail, so I'm gonna give you kind of the, the higher level, simple, simple, simple way to do this, okay? So first off is lot size, okay? It starts off with lot size, all right? And if you're in LA City, um, you wanna typically, if you're building, right, you wanna build something that's above 7,500 square feet, and I'll explain why in a little bit, why 7,500 square feet is kind of the magical WAG number, as I like to call it. If you have never heard the term WAG, it stands for wild, Deep, uh, guess wild ass guess uh, 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 number in terms of a starting point okay and why do you need that lot size is because then that lot size ties into something called far okay or uh, floor area ratio right now what floor ra- uh, area ratio stands for is a build the building code has has come up and said hey hey listen man if you're building on this so you don't build ginormous structures uh, on a lot right so that way you don't change the aesthetics of it right they'll, they'll have certain ratios that you can build up to so for the easy sake of math okay in LA City it was set at about 50% Right now, now some zones have a little bit different percentage, but for the easy sake of math, let's use 50%. What is 50% of 7,500 square feet? Let's use the math on this, right? That number comes out to if you're quick on math, is that if you take 50% of uh, 7,500 square feet, it comes out to 3,750. All right, if I did my math right in my head and in this early morning, is is three 3,750 uh, square feet. Okay, so. So that will be the starting point on a structure that you can build. 
All right, so so let's let's look at this again, okay? So meaning that if you have a lot size of 7,500 square feet, and if you use the the FAR ratio or floor area ratio, right, of 50%, you can build a 3,750 square feet structure. All right. Now, with this structure size, all right, um, there's certain things called uh, density, right? How dense can you build on that lot? Now, now, what, what does density mean? Okay, um, uh, density means that how you're structuring the internal floor plans of uh, the actual building. So in layman terms, what that really means is saying, hey, they're looking at non-livable or non-livable square foot, like for example, patios. Come on, man, really? <sighs> well, I guess it's okay. Um, uh, where was I going with this? As, as this guy is cutting me off, and literally, <laughs> and please, no Asian driver uh, jokes, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so <laughs> uh, that'll be funny. Um, so, so where was I going? Yeah, density. Yeah. So, so there's something called um, a, a density bonus that we would use, and um, when we're building these in McMansion, and the number in LA City that we have is 20% density bonus, right? So, so we can take the actual, uh, um, using the FAR ratio to get 30,750 uh, uh, square feet, and then you can take 20% of that, right? All right, do the math on that, ladies and gentlemen. What is the 20% of that? Come on, come on. It's 650, right? 650, all right? Now there are some other things in terms of density, uh, which is which then ties into the next thing is called setbacks, right? So, so, so that's the density setback, and then from there the fourth thing that they have is basically a height requirement, right? Meaning like how high can you make a structure, right? Because what they don't want people to do is create uh, create a structure that that um, you know even as though it's a single family home they make it into a five story structure. Right, because if you, stay, if you start making it like a five-story structure, one, you're you're changing the whole aesthetics of the neighborhood, but also at the same time, you're blocking view if there is any um, for the people in the neighborhood too. Okay, so those are kind of the the basic basic uh, uh, things that people look at when you're building. So, going back to the ordinance that was passed, what what changed was all right the actual. Um, the floor area ratio, it changed from the 50% to 45%, which I literally discovered, okay, um, happened in, the, I want to say, in the last 72 hours, all right, and it happened because of the deal that we're working on right now, and because the seller brought it up to my guy, and my guy said, uh, my the acquisition guy basically said, hey, man, um, I heard of this as well, um, I was talking to another real estate agent, and they brought this up, and I was just like, tell me what ordinance it is that's what I kept on saying which ordinance is it right because in my mind I was thinking that they're just strictly talking about measure s and I know it was on the book so so uh, it's one of those things where I'm always kind of like hey trust but verify so I'm just like dude so I can go ahead and go to building and safety's website I can actually read it on my read it and so I can actually understand it okay and this is what I mean by like like specialized knowledge you got to have in your marketplace right so 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 I kept on asking that but no one can f actually give me that information right so so in the last 72 hours it started with that and I started looking into it so I I called my old architect I called my old engineer right um, that did custom homes with me and I hit him up and I said hey dude um, I got this deal I'm thinking about buying this property because um, legitimately I am thinking about buying it but um, I may wholesale it as well and I need to know about this so I said hey um, no you should be fine there is nothing that I know of that has happened right that's what he said to me and I was like okay I was like all right cool this guy's knowledgeable he's the we've done you know multiple multiple projects together and I have confidence in his knowledge base so I said hey man um, uh, there's 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 nothing and um, you basically told me on the current subject property that I had the one where the seller said hey I'll take 850 for it and I know there's comps in the area for 2.2 um, um, I said hey you know what um, I think this looks like a smoking deal I might be able to actually sell this for maybe like 950 or something like that and make a quick hundred grand or something like that within a 30-day period right so I got really excited about it right something in my gut 
wasn't wasn't right okay it's one of those like six cents that I like to call it right I think uh, Malcolm Gladwell if anyone read the book uh, blink right he's a uh, um, you know if you haven't read it highly recommend for you to read the book blink as well as read the book uh, tipping point from Malcolm Gladwell but in the book blink with Malcolm Gladwell they talk about the 10,000 hours right so if you do 10,000 hours of something right you start to develop the sixth sense of of when something doesn't uh, you know feel right all right and and something did not feel right for me right so what I ended up doing was was basically with the with the with my acquisition guys we started analyzing kind of the comps right so again there's two ways to analyze the comp see see what's selling okay currently right now in the marketplace as well as what's sold on the new structure that that uh, that you're looking to build all right that's one way but the other way to do that is to go backwards and see if someone has bought okay the property that could be that you can build a brand new McMansion on right and to see if someone has bought um, close to the price point that you have almost uh, uh, that you're you're gonna get it for right uh, so so more in layman terms and practical way right we started looking at says okay um, the footprint on this eight hundred you know this eight hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar uh, that we can get on right is is it um, is there other property in a half mile radius in that pocket where uh, other homeowners have sold uh, uh, there was a sale and in that sale process um, did did developers uh, buy this Right, and then if developers bought it at that same you know structure of fifteen hundred square feet, lot size over seventy five hundred, um, what price did they buy it at? That's number one. Okay, and then we put a list together. All right, and then from there we manually search the actual building and safety, and we look at to see has there been permits actually submitted to um, LADBS or Los Angeles Building and Safety. And on top of that, we look at to see what kind of permits were submitted as well as what type of structure are, are they looking to build because it shows on there, right? Like the time on when it was submitted and what are they doing? Are they doing new construction? Are they doing strictly addition? Are they doing a, um, are they doing a second dwelling? Are they, you know, are they doing a second story, right? You can see all that stuff, right? And you can even see what, what, where they're currently at. Are they in the framing process? Are they in the electric plumbing, plumbing process? Are they just waiting? Waiting for a final sign off right so without me going out to the property to actually look right and before I send a runner out to actually go see right I can see um, just by looking at the permit history to know um, okay where are they at all right so for example if they submitted a plan you see that it's some plans has been submitted right and um, they just submitted it and they basically have a sign off on like demo or something like that right probably without me going to the property I know for a fact that there is no structure it's probably dirt Right? If there's something on excavation or something like that, you know it's really what they're doing is they're carving into the actual hill to do some type of maybe subterranean parking or maybe a tri-level structure that they're trying to do. All right, So without me looking at the property, I can figure that out. Okay, And then me looking at that, um, I can figure out the, the cost per uh, construction on that. Okay, so, so as I'm looking at this, right? Clearly, I can tell that these are all going to be McMansions. So when you're doing these McMansions type of play, right, you want to look back maybe 12 months to 18 months, all right, to see what has sold. And then when you see that, literally, you can see the history from when they bought it, when they submitted it, okay, and you can see the track record, all right. So now, earlier, I talked about two ways of comping these stuff out, right. One is looking at the future value on the new construction home on the high end, right. So again, if you do the exact same thing and reverse engineer that one on when they bought it, right, when the permits were submitted, when the permits were actually uh, approved, how long did they actually get the final uh, sign off, and then when they sold it, right, these five things, then you can find out how long that project should take. So if that project from initially when they bought it to actually when they sold that little McMansion, right, took, let's just say, um, 18 months, all right, 18 months, and you have never done a new construction home, okay, let's just say you have never done a new construction home, then is it wise for you, if you're deciding to do it, to in your calculation for cost of money, right, and stuff like that, is it wise for you to use a calculation of 12 months? No, it's not wise. Why is because a professional who's been doing it over and over, it took them 18 months. So if you use a calculation of 12 months, you're literally kaboom, shooting yourself in the foot. 
all right? Especially if you have an expensive cost of money. Ask me how I know that, okay? So, um, um, and that's before we, like literally, I didn't, uh, um, I didn't follow that, and every single time, we would be like, oh yeah, it will take less than 12 months. And literally, when we pulled it up, all the other pros were taking about like literally 10 to 12 months uh, to do a project, and we have never done it. We're just <laughs> to think it is going to tw take 12 months. No, 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 no. It actually took um, about 15 months, 16 months because because we weren't, you know, because we ran into a lot of issues. Okay, so again, that's a golden nugget there, ladies and gentlemen. So. So, so now we have these three comps, okay? And, and, and because that little gut feeling that I got, that 10,000 hour stuff I was talking about, right? Where something didn't feel right. So um, I told my guy, I said, look, man, you find the owner's number, hit these people up and ask them, hey, you know what? What are they planning to do with the property? Because you have a buyer that's really interested in buying this area. And I decided to pick up the phone and call you to see if if you are looking to actually sell this property. If so, at what price? Um, because I have a really hungry, able buyer that really wants to buy in this neighborhood. This is the one that I personally talked to. I hunted him down. Literally, I talk, I, I found the number online, right? I had to like literally go to like page, page freaking like 15 of Google to find this guy's number. And um, I found the number and the phone number originally when I called it, it went to a fax machine. So I was like, so I was literally this close to send him an e-fax and be like, call me uh, ASAP about, I was going to put like the property address and I was going to e-fax it to them. But I said, you know what? Let me just call him again. So I called that number back up and then guess what? A female picked up. So, so I, the, the guy, I said, Hey man, uh, I said, it was, it was a chick, but I said, Hey, um, I'm talking about such and such property. Um, I have a property in that area that's coming out with the same specs. Are you guys still buying in that neighborhood? And then the, uh, and then she says, and I don't know what she was the wife at that time she says um yeah i might be possibly interested what's the address and i said i said well before i give you the address i said i said what you know help me out here what are you planning to sell sell the property for are you even looking to sell and then she was just like well we're not sure if we're gonna sell yet right again playing that game right playing that game okay right because again it's a corporation that does bought and this person is a builder contractor all right and you know that they're gonna sell it for a profit they're not gonna hold on to a McMansion for for cash flow purposes on a on a property that comps out at two million dollars and then they can only rent it out for four thousand dollars a month or five thousand dollars whatever that dollar amount becomes okay they're not gonna do that so so she didn't want to tell me that or maybe she didn't know which is highly unlikely because after I said, hey, you know what, I'll send you the, the property address. Um, let me get your email um, to make things easier for communication. So I got that. I sent it over to her. And um, she basically said, um, what did she say? Um, I asked her, I said, so yeah, so so are you the wife? That's what I that's what I said, right? Bas basically using the assumption method, right? Meaning I'm assuming that she's related in one way versus saying who are you and what's your relationship with the person, right? I said, hey, I'm guessing you're the wife, right? And she's like, yeah, I am. And I was like, great, you know what? Pass, pass this information on when you get my email to such and such. And hey, let's have a conversation in the next few days because I wanted to give you first right of refusal uh, for this particular property because I know you guys are the real deal, right? So I sent that out. Didn't hear back. Crickets, crickets, crickets. I'm like, damn it, man. Did this wife not forward this information to him? Which was highly unlikely, right? Um, so um, I wanted to find this guy's cell phone number. So again, I had to go back in hunting mode on the internet. And I went to go search, 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 search. And then boom, I thought I found the number. And I started calling around. And magically, um, I know it took me like probably like a good 30 minutes of searching. But I found the number. And... Um, I found the number and I finally called. His voicemail wasn't set up right or anything like that because you know how when you call and you have a voicemail. So I basically sent him a text. I said, hey, he said, I'm calling you about your property on, boom, boom, boom. I said, um, I have another property right in that same area. Are you still buying? Please give me a call. Right? So I sent that. Nothing. All right, because usually if people are interested or they're not busy, they'll call you right back. So I went above and beyond, right? I went to the Secretary of State, pulled up their actual, um, in California, this is something new. It didn't, it, you know, just recently happened is if you have an entity's information, you can literally see their statement of information on file. So I pulled that document up and it said the guy, it said the name, and but the last name matched with the actual, uh, the person I was calling. So I was like, okay, there must be some relationships. So I Googled that guy's name, boom, pops up as a local attorney. 
all right? And as an attorney, um, I was like, all right, let me call this guy. So I pick up the phone, I call him, and the funny thing is the number I found was on Facebook, and he had like a 3.25 uh, star on there, right? And some pretty bad reviews on there. So I call it, and and instantly, I I get a, uh, um, instantly, you know, this, this lady pops up and sounds like a very um, agitated voice. Uh, such and such law's office, how can I help you? And then I was just like, yeah, I'm looking for such and such. Is he there? She goes, please hold, and literally puts me on hold. And then instantly, when that happens, this is where experience comes in, right? When that happens, my gut told me, oh yeah, he's a small, uh, he's a small time attorney, and this is a satellite office, right? Without me looking at the actual address. So while I'm on hold, I Google the address, and surprise, surprise, the satellite, you know, uh, satellite office, meaning that it's a, it's a office that is like rented out, and they have like answering service or whatever, right? And then I says, yeah, I'm trying to leave a message for for him. Can you transfer me to him? And she was like, uh, she was like, yeah, the best way is to shoot him an email. I was like, oh great. So what's his email address? I have a pen and paper. And she says the name. I was like, cool. So I get the email address. Um, and then from there, um, as I got the email address, um, I started searching a little bit more. And then because I wanted the actual guy's email, right? So I found his email too, right? The actual builder's email. So I got that and basically CC'd the attorney, CC'd him and put put in the same thing as the text. I'm calling you about the property on street address. Hey, I got another one down the street that's coming up. Are you, are you still buying? And then immediately when I sent that, right? And I said, yeah, you know, um, I got this property. And then he brings up the ordinance issue. And I'll wrap it up with this because I need to go into the office. And he brings up the ordinance issue. He's like, yeah, well, new ordinance passed. So, um, so you know, we can't build uh, the biggest this. And, you know, I'm talking on the phone like I know my stuff, right? Like I'm just like, I'm just like, well, if you're talking about Measure S, it didn't pass. So, you know, this doesn't actually apply. The only part that does apply is if this lot size, square foot, lot size is 75 square feet and under, then, then the floor ratio from the build out is from 50 percent has now gone down to 45 percent so instead of being able to build a 3700 square feet you can only do a 3225 and but it doesn't apply because it, this this lot size is 8275 right that's what i was telling him he's all like well that is true but there's other ones you know and i was like what do you mean he's all like and then he he's like can you tell me he's like what do you mean and he was like yeah uh, the density bonus uh, uh he's all like yeah the density bonus has been removed I was like, really? And now by this time, okay, when I was having this conversation, I already had a conversation with my architect who told me that it, that everything was fine. So I'm getting conflicting stuff, right? So he's saying that, hey, you know what? It's been removed. And then also, on top of that, he basically said, yeah, the garage calculation has been changed too, where now the garage calculation has to be used in uh, the actual footprint of uh, the, the building. So that, e that basically... Uh, you know, layman terms, it means that, that you can't really build it what it is. And the guy basically said, he says, oh, what's the lot size and what's the actual, um, what's the actual width and, width and length of this lot? And I can tell you what we can build. And I didn't have that. I wish I had it. Um, so a building that you're building, like a house from 4,500 square feet to 3,600 square feet, that's almost a thousand square feet in living space. All right. That's significant, ladies and gentlemen. All right, from turning it into a deal or not a deal. So for an original deal that looked magnificently like I can make maybe 50 to 100 grand per contract on these, uh, on these uh, uh, two other ones that I had, has now maybe came back to zero. And so I'm kind of like, whoa. So I get, I get all, I'm like, I guess like, okay, cool. Well, let me send you the information that I got and then please get back to me. Right, so I ended up the, I ended the conversation with the guy, and immediately after I ended this, I called the darn engineer back again, my the architect team. I said, "Man, hey, man, this is what a contractor said, man. It, so, so what's up with that? Do you know anything about this?" And he says, "Ah, Jeff, uh, I just talked to, uh, I just talked to a different architect. Um, I didn't handle that side, and we just went to uh, this morning to." <clears throat> submit and uh um we got our plans denied because yes they did pass it was literally last week that's what he said um and i was like right so um he said that and i said okay what ordinance is that right and by this time i still didn't have the name of the ordinance right so he's all like yeah i'm not sure so i have to read up on it that's what he said so i'm just like um get, okay that when you find out on it send me the article because i like to read and i like to figure out stuff you know to see how we can how we can um you know navigate through this right and that's kind of my geeky side that comes in so um that conversation ended and in my brain i'm thinking man dude like when they found that he should have picked up the phone and called me but i know he's a busy guy i have this property that's under contract 
contracted 850. I got two other ones that people want to sell in that same pocket. Um, that's going to be the same comp. So all three of these are going to be the same comp if you develop it out. Um, but that quirky ordinance. So I spent yesterday, last night, finding this, and I reached out to some of my guys that I know that are studs in the area, and I hit him up, and he basically says, yeah, you know what? Um, I'll keep my eyes and ears open. And late that night, yesterday, um, um, he sends me an email, and then this email literally has the ordinance number. And uh, I said, dude, where'd you get this email from? He's like, yeah, man, some, some agent sent it to me, and he was using it as a marketing piece. I just copied and pasted it to you. So, um, so basically, I got the ordinance number, so I sat there maybe about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, reading maybe about six different ordinances, and finally came to the section where I read it, and I found exactly what it was, which kind of makes a full circle on what it was, which is the baseline uh, mansionization ordinance and uh, the variance, uh, what is it called, um, baseline hillside ordinance and there's a subsection that's the R1 zoning that's affected as well as there's pockets of the area that's affected as well so now I got the whole city breakdown and I know what areas has been affected right and also in that quirky thing it basically says from the date of signing of that document of the ordinance um, it'll be in effect for 45 days and it says City Council has the right to extend this for up to about 23 months and um, uh, basically 23 months and some change and if you add it up it becomes basically two years Right, so it says city council uh, council members have the right to extend this moratorium for 24 months. So I saw that and I was like, this. what I want you to do is when you find opportunities where boom, instantly, because that ordinance literally wiped out like $200,000, right, out of my pocket, um, or yeah, out of the pocket. So I'm just like, man. So my brain started working. I was like, okay, depending on where the real estate cycle is going to go, and knowing that this ordinance exists, okay, there's a couple things that I can do is because if when this moratorium is and you have a two-year moratorium and let's just say play play around in the scenario right so it goes that moratorium slows the McNett mansion down right so then the comps and everything will settle down as these other ones starts clearing up right um then my idea i said man like 12 months from now today right i have the ability to go over to uh any homeowners that still fall under that mcmansion play footprint and i can go ahead and put an option on all these properties and then when the moratorium is lifted because of that you can build again these little mcmansions then instantly that contract of value is going to go up and i can go out and flip that contract or do the project myself and execute that option right so that was a kind of play that instantly popped into my mind i was like oh my gosh we're going back to 2005 days where we can do this kind of stuff where you know uh do these kind of uh, strategies so i got really excited about that after i was kind of like bummed and i was like uh, and i got excited and um so that's what i got and the, really this long long episode is to one, I wanted to give you this update on what's happening within la city um but also two right you got to go above and beyond what what a regular people are not willing to do or what your competition is not willing to do. And you get thrown, you know, lemons get thrown at you, right? You can just catch them like left and right and, you know, catch them. And then you can kind of turn them into lemonade some way, shape or form because... I wouldn't have become this excited and a little bit bullish um, about the option play if I did not start reading these ordinance and start looking at these moratorium timelines, now seeing pockets of exactly which area it is, right? So if I want to, instantly in my brain, it started systematically like, you know, stacking stuff was map out the whole area that's affected with that cross-reference that information with the zoning report, find out with that zoning uh, to see and if you do that, then if you can put an option on that property, that option will be worth really, you know, uh, uh, increase in value. Okay, especially when that moratorium gets lifted. So again, now I have a possible play as the market shift, depending on if you believe it goes up or down. If it does go up, I have a play that I can actually immediately come back to maybe 12 months from now. Right. And uh, um, so I wanted to make this the one uh, let you guys know, because you guys are awesome. Whoever's watching, especially if you're watching it live. Thank you, Clive. Thank you. And a couple other people who's watching this. Appreciate you, um, you know, listening to my rant, listening to my crazy stuff that goes through my head. Um, but also at the same time, I want to use this again to document a lot of my thought process um, on what's going on. So. Um, so crazy, but also I have something that I can turn around and talk about, right? So, so that's what I got for you guys on uh, this episode of Jeff Koga Live. And if you enjoyed it, uh, please leave me a review on iTunes if you're listening this, uh, to this on the iTunes. And if you are listening to this on the podcast, hop on over to jeffkoga.live and... Um, 
hit the like button on the Facebook page and literally watch me as I as I'm building uh, my company uh, from a solopreneur to actually building a company uh, and uh, uh, you can follow the journey and literally watch me work every single day for about 12 to 15 hour days all right so that's what I got for y'all uh, love you guys for everyone that's uh, watching and listening in uh, this is Jeff Koga I'm headed into the office and I'm about to start streaming live again in there take care and bye bye